So I thought the first thing we would do is just have some silence. Um, and while we're sitting in worship, I would love everybody to think about what what has brought them here today and what you're looking to get out of this. So let's take a few minutes and maybe a couple of people will pop in and you're welcome to speak out of the silence, but everyone will get a chance. So. Welcome, friends. So, I would love to hear from a few people um, what they were considering in those moments, um, whether in the chat or when unmuted, whatever is more comfortable.
First of all, welcome. It's good to have you. And in thinking about why I'm here tonight is I'm in, very interested in activism in general. Uh, specifically, I've worked with youth uh, of all ages through my life. And, um, and that's a, it's, a, it's a place where I see a lot of growth and excitement uh, about uh, faith and and their beliefs, you know, developing is in you know, for youth, and uh, so it's good to hear your perspective on that, and and more and more how we can be a part of that. Any advices and thoughts are welcome. Our puppy is making herself heard right now. Well, if there is no one else. Oh, Can you speak a little louder. Um, I have the speakers all the way to full volume and my hearing aids are turned up to oh, full volume <laughs> and maximum amplification i'm we are both still having some trouble understanding you certainly i can and let me let me see i have a couple of microphones as well and sometimes they um act up on this computer <laughs> is that any better I think it's better. Wonderful. Yes, I just needed to switch the microphone. All right, well, I'll get into, I was um, considering uh, the talks that I'm having with you. Um, I have three of them for the, for your yearly meeting and thinking about how basically every one of them is simply my story, but told through different lenses and how I've become an activist, how I've been involved um, and how my Quaker faith has been, um, been instrumental in that. So in a sense, what I am is introducing myself and introducing what I've done. Um, I grew up uh, in Annapolis Friends Meeting in Maryland, uh, outside of DC. Um, I've been homeschooled my entire life and grew up with a marine biologist for a mother. Um, okay, I will try my best. I can also see, oh, sorry, that was a direct message, but uh, I will try my best to keep the volume up and we might be able to get another microphone here if it, <laughs> if it continues acting up. Um, but I've been homeschooled my entire life um, with a marine biologist as a mother um, and a lawyer as a father. <laughs> um, and I always joke that what happens when you put those two together is you get a climate activist. <laughs> with my upbringing being very scientific, um, I've always known that climate change was an issue and had the environment as well as climate change and the anthropogenic or human caused effects of it. Um, they've always been there. I've known about them. I can't remember a time where um, we sat down and talked about that. They've always been a part of my life and becoming an activist was a very natural thing for me. Um, and it started in my meeting because of the fact that so many Quakers are active and that being surrounded by a community of active, engaged people uh, taught me how to be an activist in a sense. It showed me that it was possible. It showed me how to do it. Um, and it gave me the opportunities in a loving community and supportive community to take those steps and finally become active. I've been, 
I've worked in a number of youth groups and youth areas. Um, my first my first youth organization that was just youth was um, Zero Hour. Uh, and then lately, and what I've been most active on is Fridays for Future, which is the movement uh, that Greta Thunberg started in Sweden to strike from schools on Fridays, um, or in my case, to strike from your education. Uh, and in 2019, inspired by my Quaker faith and the idea that um, actions speak louder than words, I took a 90-day silent strike outside of the Maryland State House uh, to advocate for environmental rights, um, specifically in that case, Maryland, a green amendment that would go into the state constitution for a... Um, for the right to a healthy and livable environment for all Marylanders. But what, what I think, I think the basic problem that we have when we talk about fostering youth activism and how do we get in youth involved is that we think of it as a separate it's how do we get youth involved? How do we get youth to our meetings? It's not how do we get a person? Um, because what I've found uh, is that if you can engage people, if you can engage middle schoolers, you can engage adults. And if you think that um, something isn't going to work for, um, younger people, it probably actually isn't working for most of your audience. Um, and what all of that is, is building relationships with people. It's building relationships and it's building community. Uh, and that has been my biggest, my biggest strength, but also the most difficult part in all of my work has been building that community, building that trust and that individual understanding with the people who you're working with, um, whether it's adults, whether it's other youth or my peers or kids younger than me. Um, and I've had wonderful success I have um, friends around the world who help support me. Um, but I've also had, I've been through some fights within the movement because we do not have that strength. Um, and what it comes down to is working with individuals to make the whole that is the movement which is, it seems very simple, but it's also incredibly difficult. <laughs> um, and you have to recognize that sometimes you're not the best person to do that in a case. Excuse me for a moment. The, uh, we have a couple of dogs who are <laughs> oh, oh goodness gracious <laughs> we've had a new puppy join but um my most recent uh foray into activism and work um i went over to europe um for cop 26 uh in glasgow um, with Quaker Earth Care Witness uh, as a NGO um, observer. Uh, and that was an incredibly, new, an, in, not incredibly, I meant um, a completely new world for me. Um, and yet also a very familiar one because I got to meet people from around the world that I've worked with for years, but I've never gotten to see in person. And to be able to 
strengthen those ties that I knew were there, um, but was finally able to see was absolutely wonderful. But then being at COP was an experience in and, of, in and of itself because we finally got to see how some of our work plays a role on that level. Um, and what's happening at the internet, uh, what's happening in our world right now, because after the pandemic, we're having a lot of change and we have a lot of new energy, but... <laughs> hey! Um, but we are not, we're still moving at a snail's pace, um, which is incredibly. <laughs> uh, uh, we're trying here, sorry. But it's both incredibly energizing because we're having so many people who want to get involved. Um, and yet it's also unfortunate because we we have to move so quickly at this point <laughs> so very quickly um and when we look at how what we're actually doing it's going to, it's going to take a lot to get there. So I'm very happy that so many people are interested and excited. <laughs> um, but we will, but translating that into something, into the change that we need is going to be incredibly difficult. But we're getting there and we're seeing, we are so much closer than when, <laughs> when I started. Um, so much closer. I wonder, is anyone here active already on climate change or a different issue? Um, wonderful. Um, just climate change or other things? You can talk, it's all right. <laughs> Climate and uh, and the biosphere. <laughs> Climate and other things. Uh, Climate justice. Climate and indigenous rights. Peacemaking, peace building. Climate, which encompasses justice, the biosphere, economic, human economics, et cetera. Uh, biosphere, death penalty, abolition. And are you working with youth, whether in your meeting or outside of it? There are basically no youth above the age of what nine eight nine twelve right. oh there's one twelve um in our meeting everyone is younger and we've just started we've just resumed um uh, in person it's part of the children's program well uh, the uh <clears throat> group where I have my primary uh, <clears throat> action uh, ha has a lot of uh, overlap with youth. We have some youth participation in, in our group and we have actively supported uh, some youth groups, youth-led climate groups, so there's interface with them inner inner uh, interfacing with them yeah what are your meetings in your first day schools like i should have asked that earlier actually i grew up in a meeting with a very small first day school but i know some can be even smaller 
Well, I'm in Houston, and uh, we uh, don't have any active uh, <clears throat> youth in our meeting uh, except elementary school and younger. Uh, I guess they're all, pretty much all elementary school now. Anyone else? Rich can speak for San Antonio since she's the the most active in getting it resumed. Putting her on the spot here. I'm just counting up. Um, we're just bringing back some of the families who were involved before the pandemic. Um, but people live at, at different uh, distances, and so they don't all get together at the same time. Um, I think we, we have 10 children at one time or another. Uh, but we're, we're looking at two areas. One, we're investigating the testimonies and doing readings on uh, a variety that, that then tie back into uh, testimony. Um, and, uh, and preparing them for worship, which is something I find very rewarding that, that they seem to be getting the hang of it. But uh, uh, it's not just going in and being quiet, that there's something more going on. And that's exciting. But these are young. Um, our youngest um, will be five in a couple of weeks. Um, our oldest right now is uh, 12. I went to my first protest with other Quakers when I was about nine. Nine. <laughs> um, so it it starts young, but it certainly it's difficult because you're dealing with hard, often painful issues, um, and trying to empower without. creating debilitating despair. I suppose that's the issue for all of us, though. Um, and what we face on a daily basis. Yes. Um, I'm in Fayetteville, Arkansas, so northwest corner of Arkansas. And our meeting is relatively small. And uh, we just had, we just restarted our first day program. And we have a, a, a new group of very young kids. And so um, they're like between seven and two. <laughs> and, but I think one of the things that our approach has been is to really um, help them be, enjoy nature and be aware of nature. So we're, uh, they always go outside and, um, and they check out the, uh, the birds and uh, the status of our wildflowers and um, the activity that we did uh, a couple weeks ago was to build bee motels together with the whole meeting, the adults and the kids together and have an intergenerational activity. And, uh, and then we're also doing things like planning a outing to a, um, a, a preserve that Nature Conservancy has uh, about 30 minutes from where our meeting is. And so, and again, uh, it, it's an area that, that would be very easy walking for the, for the toddlers as well as our older members. Um, and, and just kind of really trying to, to infuse the kids with that love and appreciation for nature. Because it's unless you love what you have, you're not gonna work to preserve what you what you want, what you love. So 
really kind of building that awareness and that and that love of the land that aloha aina with for the kids so that they 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 know what 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 they can fight for yeah and i think that's having that that passion is important i think so building that with their kids absolutely it it all starts with appreciation and love um and then knowing knowing that you have ground underneath your feet to stand up and speak about what you care about. Um, and that's what the community gives us. And the, it's very much like a tree, I suppose. <laughs> ah, I'm falling into, I feel like, Quakers half speak in metaphors all of the time, but that that's the, uh, always the image that I have is those being create creating youth activism, supporting an activist and becoming an activist is creating a healthy and happy human being and growing into one. Um, and that starts with our circles of influence, whether that's ourselves and creating change at a personal level, but then our families and our friends and then our wider communities of our meetings and, um, and then further and further out until you get to the world and creating change at that level. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit all over the place tonight. Um, <laughs> this would not be my most well put together uh, thoughts, but um, I'm trying my best uh, with what I have at the moment. <laughs> Which I suppose part of it is realizing when your best does not necessarily live up to what you want it to be. I see a raised hand, or at least I think that is one. Yeah. Well, uh, I, some of the things you said, I wanted to tie in with you and what Karen and others have said. It is, you know, the building of community is so essential to this process too. So you're building the character the integrity in the children, in supporting that, encouraging that, building the community of the, of the children and with adults and, and with you know, each other and becoming friends and knowing each other and showing that, that, that care uh, that, and love of the, the environment that's right there at the meeting house and expanding further from there. Uh, and those are the, the, the building blocks of all activism is being part of a community and know how to work with other people and uh, to get things done and to, to work together for those those purposes. Yes, absolutely. And when so what um, my work in Fridays for Future, uh, what I found was very interesting is that um, making decisions within a movement is very much like making decisions in a meeting. Um, there's what, uh, what we used for decision making and what we, we still use um, is basically Quaker process. Uh, it's a little bit different in that it doesn't have the grounding in faith um, and with a bunch of teenagers, it's sometimes less civil, but it's, it's the same thought of discussing together to, and ironically enough at this moment, properly uh, expressing your points to um, come to a consensus. 
uh, which is it's always interesting when you when you get to kind of compare your monthly meetings business meeting to uh, to a group of teenagers trying to figure out what they're doing. Um, but it's it's a community that you're trying to um, you're trying to work with and you're trying to figure out where you're going um, and a movement like Fridays for Future is essentially the same. Well, it is the same. <laughs> I, yes. I like what Karen had said and what she's doing. Um, I have a little bit of a different take on it. I don't know, six years ago or something like that, um, I gave a forum uh, here in San Antonio and the first slide was one word spelled Omicron, Iota, Kappa, Omicron, Sigma, Oikos, which is where we get ego and eco is in ecology, and eco as in economics. And the original Greek word meant um, inheritance or a state, um, your real property, and that which you could leave to your descendants. Um, There's a, I have, it's clear to me that if we continue on the course that we're going on, it won't be all that many decades before we've lost um, what humans have created, whether it's the Mona Lisa or the, the, the pyramids or uh, quantum mechanics, um, calculus, the Merchant of Venice, um, and that we're, we're so intimately tied, we think of ourselves as, we have a tendency to think of ourselves as so very independent of uh, the rest of the natural world, and we're not. We are in incredibly dependent on uh, what was described earlier as nature. Um, I've said enough for the moment. Paul, you can just talk, yes. Um, I don't want to interrupt your flow, but um, whenever it's a good time, um, you've already said a, a little about it, but if, if you could tell us a little more about uh, Fridays for Future, um, exactly what that is and what that looks like, just whenever it seems like a good time to do that. Oh, absolutely. Oh, and then it looks like Andrea has her hand up as well. Um, but I think I can start there. Um, so Fridays for Future was a move, is a movement that um, was started by Greta Thunberg in Stockholm. Uh, and she started striking outside the Swedish parliament. Um, so she, would, she wouldn't go to school. Um, and it started every day for a few weeks during the presidential election. Um, and then switched to every Friday. Uh, and it, quite quickly took out uh, took off around the world um, with the idea of continuous action. So it's not a one big protest of get as many people there as possible. The power in that action was being there every week of not letting someone of not letting the world forget. Um, 
I started striking in 2018 uh, in DC in December. Um, and then at that January 2019 uh, was when I started my silent strike outside of the Maryland General Assembly. Um, I wanted to do something more and the way that um, the Maryland session works is it's only three months long. Uh, so you only get three months of a year and it's this kind of, it's this sprint to get everything that you want to get past done then because you just, you'll have to wait till next year. Uh, and it's a very outdated system. It was uh, designed that way when it started and, <laughs> it, um, and uh, it just hasn't 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 changed since uh, and it's it's actually very inequitable because many people don't have the opportunities to actually be a representative because who's going to hire a person that can't work for three months out of the year um, but we try the best with what we have um, and it usually takes bills three to four years to get done um, and that year uh, it was an incredible experience for me um, to be out there and not talking and also getting to see really when my voice was needed um, and when I had something that was truly unique to say. Um, and we did, we did not get my, the specific bill that I was working on passed, but we did get uh, the Maryland Clean Energy Jobs Act passed that year which was a <laughs> roller coaster of a ride that session, but we did get there. Uh, it got passed uh, on the very last day of the session. <laughs> um, Andrea, you had something to say. I think that's how I pronounce your name. Uh, yeah, this is Andrea with uh, Friends Meeting of Austin. Um, could you, I do have something to say, but what you just said about the bill, could you speak to what that bill um, was that was passed? So the Clean Energy Jobs Act, um, the biggest part of it uh, was getting to, I believe it was a pledge for 30% um, renewable energy uh, by 2030 or might have been 2040, it was several years ago. <laughs> um, and that was the biggest part of the bill for climate activism, uh, from a climate activism standpoint. Um, the most contested part uh, and the reason why it took so long to get it passed and why it was, um, was because the original bill wanted to take incineration out of the clean energy portfolio standards. Um, so basically right now, incineration in Maryland gets subsidies for being a green energy. Um, and we have this issue where we have two incinerators in the uh, state. One is in um, Prince George's or Montgomery County and is basically, it does the best it can to be green, um, but of course it's still incinerating. Uh, whereas we have another one in Baltimore um, that is on the upper opposite side of the spectrum, um, which of course is, an, is a huge environmental justice issue. Um, and we know why it was placed in that community. Um, but that was not only contested uh, outside of environment, uh, environmental community, um, the environmental community, but it was also somewhat contested in the environmental community, whether or not that part of that part of the bill should be in there. Um, and it got to the point where we had two, two copies of the bill, <laughs> one in the Senate that said that had incineration still in the bill and one in the House that didn't. Um, and eventually that part of the bill ended up getting scrapped, <laughs> which was rather unfortunate. 
Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, my question to you, uh, and I'm wondering, with your activism, are you bringing youth in to your work? And are you working with youth? And as for those of us that are, were once a youth, but are no longer youth, um, we, we had our own distractions to distract us from the work. And I'm just curious as someone who would like to see more young people involved, you know, that's the big story for Quakers, we're all gray hair and, um, or nearing that, push and geezer as I like to say. Um, so what, what is it that we're missing? What is it that we need to include? How, how, do, how do you as a young person engage other young people? Um, you know, what makes you tick and how can we help? I wish I had a straightforward or simple answer that, to that question because I mean, yes, that's why we're all here and that's essentially what I've been asked in every interview or talk that I've given is how do we get youth involved? Um, and I have been, I've been working in youth spaces since I was 13. Um, uh, I, I think the, my most successful uh, getting other youth involved was um, Parachutes for the Planet. Uh, and that was, that's with a group called the Mother Earth Project. Um, and that was creating, well, it started in 2017. I wanted to get youth to the People's Climate March in DC. Um, I actually had this kind of, this dream of getting um, a whole bunch of youth to march with me. Um, and my idea was to have a giant monarch butterfly for all sorts of symbolism. It, um, has meaning to me as both the butterfly effect, but also the idea of um, when the monarchs come up in the spring to this area, um, it's seven generations in the summer before that seventh generation goes back to Mexico. Um, so thinking forward, um, and then it also has personal symbolism <laughs> um, with friends and mentors um, to me. But my, what ended up happening is that I created this giant play parachute with my family. Um, and we had youth around the uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia area sign that parachute um, and brought it to the march. And in six weeks, we got about 1600 parachute signatures. Um, and that grew into a larger part project partnering um, with another family in Maryland of getting people around the world to create parachutes in their communities and with youth. Um, and that's been incredibly successful. I think partially because it's something hands-on that can be done. Um, you're working with your hands and also that it's art and creating something um, to help process what we're dealing with and um, in a different way and to communicate that. Uh, so I think there's somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 parachutes now, um, some of which we have uh, are stored in Maryland and then we bring them out to different marches or events um, to stimulate conversation and community. Um, but then some of which are, are housed in the community that made them um, and are displayed in various places. Uh, they're absolutely beautiful. If you go to um, the Mother Earth Project website, uh, which I can bring up actually, um, there is a database that has all the parachutes and um, pictures of all of them, um, which it, it's amazing, honestly. And the fact that we have the, some from all over the world um, and that it resonated so well was, it's a little surreal. Uh, 
some of my favorites. Our first international ones were from the Marshall Islands. Um, and they're absolutely gorgeous. And I remember trying to, um, trying to collaborate with the teacher there um, was somewhat difficult because of their connectivity issues and then our connectivity issues being up here. Um, but they are gorgeous. Uh, and then there's another one, one my one of my favorites is the this one from Nigeria that that um, is Mother Earth. I I can't remember the number for it, um, but they're real. They're all absolutely beautiful. I would really encourage you to go and take a look at all of them, or as many. Um, in fact, I can probably bring up a few. Uh, yes, and then of course there's there's my parachute, which I might just bring down to Texas actually, because I have it up here, um, and share with you all. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I would be interested to know about how you did your your silent protest. Yeah, how did how does one do that at the you know when you were there at the your legislature? <clears throat> um, I sat outside. Uh, so our legislature meets um, Monday through Friday. So I just went in every day and sat there on the steps. <laughs> Uh, I, I had a whiteboard, um, so I, I could communicate if I needed to, um, uh, and I was crocheting, uh, little butterfly pins, um, and I had a scarf that I would crochet a piece of every day, but I sat out there and just every day they had to walk by me. <laughs> On the last day, I um, uh, we got these big tubs of ice cream and handed them out to everybody. Uh, and I finally said hello to some people, and everyone was quite surprised. <laughs> yes, and we, um, on my 15th birthday, actually, I was out there, um, and we had a big rally of youth that came in, um, not for my birthday, it was simply coincidental, but um, it was a very special moment. <laughs> Did you use the fight board to explain why you were there? Or was there some type of coverage that they got the word of why you were sitting there? When I first started, I would try, but uh, with the whiteboard, um, but you kind of learn how to communicate with the resources you have um, and not, it's, it's different. You can't sit there and write out um, an entire speech about whatever it is, um, but I, I had some pamphlets to handout about the specific bill and then the other environmental priority bills um, that year uh, that came out of the the other organizations involved. Um, but for the most part, I just used the whiteboard for saying hello and <laughs> who I was. Uh, but the interesting thing about, so the other, I mean, Maryland is a fairly liberal democratic state. So you wouldn't think it would be that difficult to get environmental um, bills passed, especially ones that are not considered very controversial. Um, but for, for the longest time, the democratic uh, establishment had this rule uh, of they would, it, you could only have one environmental topic a year pass, um, <laughs> which 
was interesting. So uh, some years it was oysters or some years it was trees and then you could have the tree bills pass or the oyster bills pass. Um, but you couldn't do anything with climate change or <laughs> climate justice or what it was um, interesting to say the least. <laughs> And we are getting close to 8.30 here. Perhaps we can settle into some more silence for a bit.
Well, thank you all. And I look forward to meeting, hopefully, most of you in Texas. Please bring your parachute. I certainly will. Mm -hmm. That'll be fun. Yes. Well, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, Callan. Be well and be safe on the road. Thank you. As well. Good night. Good night. Thank you.